stories help us to understand the world around us. They allow us to laugh. They allow us to cry. They give us the ability to feel and provide us with an outlet to heal. Join me as I get to know some of the amazing people behind the stories that we read in order to truly discover the story that has been hidden within each of us. My name is Bree Smith, and this is the Author Push Talk Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Author Push Talk Show. I am your host, Bree Smith, and today we have a phenomenal woman that we have a chance of interviewing. Her name is Nedra Brown, and she is going to be talking about her memoir today. So thank you so much, Nedra, for just coming on here today um, and just talking with us. So can you please just um, give us a little bit more background information on who you are? I will. Thanks a lot for having me, by the way. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, okay. So. I am a mom. I have three kids. Um, I have two te teenagers and a five-year-old. Um, I'm an author, an entrepreneur. Um, I'm also in school right now pursuing a PhD in developmental psychology. So I'm coming out of my bachelor's and going into my master's. Um, but really, I'm just an everyday mom and a round the way girl. And I'm just trying to um, basically just kind of, I'm in my evolution process, so to speak. So Amen. Amen. I definitely hear you on that. And congratulations um, with school. Uh, I, listen, I didn't went back. I got my um, bachelor's in psychology. And then I was like, do I get a master's in this nonprofit study? So I ended up just getting a graduate certificate. But I love education. I feel like, um, I don't know, I just love learning. So I just want to say congratulations on that. And then just mm -hmm. to pursue. So I do have a question. So are you jumping um is your program allowing you to do like both your master's and doctorate at the same time or um I wish I wish it was um like that because it'd probably be a lot easier but um the master's program will be a year and a half and then when I come out of that the doctoral program will be a three-year program so okay the bachelor's is about three and a half so that was like the longest and the most teeth pulling I feel like experience um but that's coming to the end and I'm just like thank you Jesus because Lord knows I'm so tired of writing all these papers um but it's not combined I wish it was I do know there are programs like that though okay okay well that is great news I love to hear that um so I just want to talk more about your book so um I know it's called Baltimore Imprint and you said that it is a memoir based upon your life um so can you talk a little bit about what's going on in the book um, so that the readers and the listeners could uh, understand? Um, the book is really loaded. Um, it's a lot of experience in it, um, experiences in it. It's a lot of traumatic experiences. Um, the book kind of gives an account of like my childhood trauma experiences as well as my marriage. Um, it starts out with one of like um, the biggest imprints of my life when I was about um, eight years old, my mother and my father divorced, and that was kind of like a traumatic experience because I went from having like a two-parent household to a one-parent household, and the changes were just extremely hard for me, um, and then my mother went into a new relationship, and she ended up getting into a relationship with a man that was verbally abusive. He was physically abusive, and he was just like the polar opposite of my father, so for about four years, I watched her go through this tumultuous relationship, and it kind of um, scarred me in a lot of different ways. Um, and after just seeing that the repetition of it and not understanding why she didn't walk away, it kind of just started doing things to my psyche that I wasn't aware of. And at the age of about 11, I intercepted a fight between her and her partner at the time. Um, and it just appeared to me like, you know, this man is either going to hurt my mother severely or he's going to kill her. And I just, I intercepted the fight and I stabbed him. Um, in doing so, he went to the hospital. He was in ICU for a long time and I had to undergo counseling. And so after going through all these changes, that kind of sent me to a, into a realm of other changes. Um, and the book just kind of talks about those things I went through as a child and how I kind of went through all these traumatic experiences that were not really, um, I just felt like it was not focused on, even though I had to go to counsel for a short period of time. After the counseling kind of became like, the elephant in the room, you know, my parents are very old school, um, Virginia parents. So it's just like, you know, it became that thing where we know it affected you, but nobody's going to touch it. Nobody's going to say anything. Mm -hmm. And so in turn, seeing that be my environment, I encompassed it. And I kind of carried this paradigm with me of like, you know, 
don't ask, don't tell, don't speak. And that kind of led into my marriage. I ended up marrying someone who had been through even more trauma than me. And so his trauma became my trauma. And it just became this whole thing where I kind of started to see my life was just spiraling because I hadn't healed from my previous trauma. And then I had developed basically like a trauma bomb with someone because I meet this person. It's like, oh, you've been through these things. I've been through these things. And during my time in the relationship, I tried to heal and I did go through my healing process, but he never did. And so it just became redundant. And I started feeling like, you know, I can help this person, not realizing that I have failed to help myself. You know, I can't offer you solace when I haven't offered it to myself. And so the book just kind of goes through these different um, stages of development in my life and different experiences. And I basically just try to show the pathology of the abuser and the abuse to kind of give people a better understanding of it. Because a lot of times we just, you know, we focus on the person that's being hurt and not the person that's inflicting the hurt. And so I kind of try to show it from both vantage points, if that makes sense. Yes. And you, you, listen, you have given me a lot of things I want to like just dive into. That was so good um, because I don't know if you've ever heard my story before, but growing up, I was abused. Um, my father was physically, mentally, and emotionally abusive to my mother. And I watched that, you know what I mean? And then a lot of times he would take it out on me and I was the oldest child. And so, um, I'm, I have entered, and this is so crazy. I have intercepted a fight between um, my parents. I think that was probably like the last big fight that they had. Cause I remember uh, going to school late. I was always late. I think this was in high school, but you got to imagine like I'm dealing with this since I was like probably about eight, nine years old when I'm actually starting to be aware and conscious of what's going on in the house all the way up until 16, 17. And I remember, I think it was my junior year of high school, I was always late every morning. And I remember having a counselor, like, well, the lady who did the attendance, and she would look at me and say, why are you late? Like, she was so nasty. And I felt like I couldn't say, well, my mom is at home getting her butt beat every morning, and I'm having to run to protect her. That's why I'm late every day. Because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I have younger siblings in the household. Um, you know, they have cognitive delay. I don't want us having to be put out, you know what I'm saying? And we're in the foster care system. Like, where are we going to go? You know what I mean? There's a lot of other issues. So for me, I felt like I had to take on all of that trauma, you know what I mean? And hold that and be like, okay, I got to be the strong person. Now, just kind of like similar to you where your uh, parents actually ended up divorcing, like my parents actually ended up finally divorcing at that point. And I felt like it was the best thing that happened for us because I grew up, like I said, like just having so many issues. I have very low self-esteem. Um, I didn't know my identity, you know what I mean? And it just really messed with me. And so me witnessing that as a child, you know what I'm saying? Like witnessing all that as a child, when I become older, I'm like, okay, I need love. I need somebody to love me. I'm going to, whoever I find is going to love me. That's who I'm going to be with, right? You know? you know what I mean? So I'm running into relationships with people and, and they're just like my father. Yeah. And then and I'm like- the thing that you gravitate towards. It's almost like we are stamped. And it's, I think one of the biggest things, because I heard you say about the counselor and it's so funny how- just the pathology of abuse and trauma is always just textbook. You know, it doesn't matter who it is, where it's coming from. I remember my, my brother was labeled a prodigy at a young age. He taught himself how to play cello. He taught himself how to read music. He ends up getting a full scholarship into uh, one of the biggest schools in the world and just walking into these spaces where he could have excelled so much, but because of all the trauma we have witnessed, it kind of just stamped us. And you do become a person where it's like, you want that love that you didn't have. You want that attention you didn't have. So even when it comes to you in an unhealthy format, you accept it because it's like, I already know this form. I know the broken. I know the tarnished. I know the anger. I know the aggression. And so you welcome it, not realizing that you are just in a cycle, you know, that is unbreakable. And I was just like you. I was the oldest of my siblings. And I was always being like the protector for everybody, even my mom, because as a child, you don't know that this energy that you are putting out into your space is the energy you're supposed to be receiving. And so I internalized a lot of things. And like you, I, I had a very low self-esteem. People always looked at me and thought like, oh, she's confident because I was always into hair, fashion, always very smart. And I always had like a flamboyant outer kind of thing going on. So people would look at me 
and see components of my being that weren't even present, you know, and assume like, oh, Nidra's confident, Nidra's smart, when inside I'm battling all these things that I don't even know how to verbalize. I don't even know how to look at myself and see the, the value that's there. So, you know, you go into these relationships and it, it bleeds into other spaces. I found that it was in my romantic relationships and my friendships. And it's just sad because you see so many stories and there's so many strong people that have been broken early on that they have so much value and so much light, but it's just, it's just blocked, you know, and I just like you, I just, I didn't see myself and it took me a long time to really see myself. And then once I started breaking down those walls and realizing like, you know, I don't want to be a product of my environment and making these changes. It was hard for me because I realized that even though I don't want to be in the space, I'm in a relationship with someone that's in the same space as me and I'm trying to help them and I haven't even helped myself properly, but it's, it's tough. Right. And I think that's another big thing too. Um, because that's, that's how it was with me. I'm like, Oh, I could fix this person. And then it's like, but girl, you ain't even worked on yourself. Girl, you, know? you was over here broken in pieces. How you going to do it? But girl, I got this, like I'm his blessing. You know, we, we tell ourselves all the stuff that's just not rational. Like, you know, God sent me here to help him since he did not run, run. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And I think um, it took for me, because I remember praying. I was praying a long time for my husband. And so, and I'm praying. I'm like, okay, God, I want a man that's X, Y, and Z. And then I get a man that's X, Y, and Z. And I don't know how to handle him. I know what to do with him. Yes. And, and so last year, because like this is like our first year of marriage, um, you know, going in 2020 into 2021. But it was like going, like having to experience all that. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm taking my brokenness into this relationship. He didn't grow up in an abusive household. Like his parents was, you know, a nice suburban family, like the typical average American black family. You know what I mean? They love each other. They support each other. I never had that. And so for me, I felt like I was self-sabotaging a lot of the, of the, the relationship. And, and it was like, the Lord was saying, look, you need to wake up, sis. Because if you don't get this together, you're going to end up losing a good man. And this is what you prayed for. This is the blessing that I'm giving you. And you're going to end up ruining it. And so for me, I was like, okay, I got to go and get, we got to, I'm like, babe, we got to do marriage counseling. I need to get actual individual counseling because I have to go back and deal with my childhood trauma that I never dealt with because I'm carrying all this pain, all this baggage into our relationship. And it's not fair to you. You know what I mean? It's not. It's not. And it's, it's a it's a blessing that you were able to recognize that because a lot of people don't. And I feel like it's, it's just so weird because I feel like a lot of times we want love and we go through these different things and we receive it. And when it does come to us in a healthy form, we end up being the unhealthy person, you know? And it's like, we don't see like, you know, I'm still repeating the cycle because now I have this unhealthy stuff out of my environment and I'm implementing it back in my environment because I haven't healed but I do think that it's a beautiful thing that you were to, able to recognize that because a lot of people don't. And that's part of the reason why I have sat still. Like since my my divorce, I have not been on a date. I have not really given my phone or anything because I, I do know that even though I've gone through counseling, I've gone through my healing process, I'm not all the way there. So I just feel like it would not be fair to go into a relationship knowing that I still have these like fragmented pieces that I need to work on. But um, something I do want to know is like, how did you, how did you handle that? Did you sit down and tell your husband, like, you know, I'm being this way because I've been through these things or like, you know, how are you able to kind of move through that? Honestly, it was all the Lord because it was like, it was just like a, a lot of circumstances were just coming up. And, um, you know, when you have like really good people in your life who start to kind of, who know you and they could tell you about yourself, like, sis, like, it's not him, that's you. You know what I mean? And so, and you're like, man, for real, I ain't like that, you know, because in your mind, you thinking everything's good. And it, and, it, and it began to open up and the Lord began to show me, and I hate to say it, but this is just me being transparent and real. He was like, this is the ugliness in you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, you're a beautiful woman on the, you know, you have beautiful qualities, but this is the brokenness and this is the ugliness in you. And in order for me to elevate you, in order for me to help expand your life and your marriage and, you know what I'm saying, for you to move into the area and the calling that I have for both of you guys, I need you to deal with that. And, and I'm telling you, the Lord is so good because, I, I mean, me and him have a really good relationship. So, like, he'll sit there and be like, you, you got to deal with that. Because he told me one time, it was like, either you deal with that 
or I'm going to, this marriage will end and he will be married to somebody else. And I think that was like the most hardest truth that I had to swallow and be like, okay, Brianna, you need to get yourself together. You have a good husband. You ain't dealing with the rest of this crap that these women are dealing with out here. Your husband works. He provides for you. He loves you. He's affectionate. Like, I'm sorry, like you, that's you. And you're going to have to work on that if you want to save your marriage. And in me, I realized too, because in my family, I looked at my family on both sides. I have broken, like, it's like a generational curse. You know what I mean? It's like my mother went through divorce. My grandmother went to divorce. Like my aunts, my cousins. I'm like, or if they're still married, it's like infidelity. And I'm like, I want to be the person to break the cycle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's so funny. My cousin called me and she said, you got to be the one to break the cycle. And I'm like, if you only knew, I know I got to be the one to break the cycle. And even on my father's side, it's like people are married, but nobody really is faithful. You know what I mean? Or they're abusive. And I was like, I, I, I refuse. And you know what I mean? And I'm like, I don't want to have to sit there and get married again. You know what I mean? Um, so that was like my biggest thing. Um, but I do have a question for you. So do you think um, people of color are more open to getting mental health now than before? Because I know you had mentioned um, a lot of it, because I know my mother is very old school. It's like, what well, goes on in this house stays in this house. And I want to know that's like, girl, I'm breaking that. All this, <laughs> let's be quiet. I'm done. You know what I mean? So I do think um, for the younger generation, it's becoming more of a thing now. Um, plus we have social media. We have all these different people that are acting as martyrs for mental health. Um, but I do think for a lot of the older generation, it's still the same thing. But I do think that um, people are coming out of that. I even do that with my children. Like, um, even though I'm studying this stuff and I'm really good with helping people with their mental health, I always try to encourage my children, like, you know, to talk to me. But I always say, do you think you need to talk to somebody else? Because I do know the importance of just having a space where you can vent and just having a, a party that's just not biased, doesn't know anything but what you are divulging. And can see it from a different, you know, level um, that's not so personable. But I do think people are becoming more aware that mental health is very important. And people are also recognizing these chains and how, you know, a lot of times the lineage of abuse is a lot, you know, far behind. It's like you went through it. Your parents went through it. Their parents went through it each time, leaving all these different scars. And people don't realize that it can be watered down, you know, but you have to choose to break the cycle like you, like you stated. So I think, um, I think that is important, but I think people are becoming a more, more, um, more aware and just more ready to do that in, in regard to their mental health as back in the day, it was like, you never do that. You know, like you said, what stays, what goes on in this house stays in this house. Like my mother has said that so many times. So it's like, you kind of know, like whatever you're feeling, even if a teacher or somebody inquires, it's like, you say nothing, you know? Yep. Yep. So what do you say to a young person um, who's living or who kind of grew up like us in a very traumatic environment um, and, and, and they've witnessed a toxic relationship? What advice would you give to them? Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I would give them is just, um, you know, recognizing that you have awareness and you are, we are all our observant beings. And if you see something, you feel something isn't right, you need to take a stand and walk away because a lot of times we stay in these traumatic spaces because we feel like we need love, we need care, we need support. And most of the times you aren't even getting those things that you're afraid that you won't receive if you leave. It's already not there. So I think the biggest thing is just knowing that you can walk away and be okay. You know, you can heal from anything, you can grow from anything. So just take a stand and change the narrative because at the end of the day, you are in control of your environment and you're in control of your own mental health and your physical well-being. So you have to be willing to stand up and take the initiative. Hey, Amen. Um, so what are you hoping that the readers gain from reading um, your memoir? Um, I just hope that people see mostly women and young men to that you can overcome anything. You know, some, a lot of times we don't get to choose the environments that we are born into. We don't get to choose what we are exposed to, but we do have control over what we do with that information because everything that you go through can be used for good and for bad. You know, if someone would have spoken to me 10, 12 years ago, I never would have thought that I would be in the spaces that I am now doing the things that I'm doing now. So I think people should just take from it that you can triumph from any situation in your life, no matter how good or bad, you know, it's all about, you know, taking a leap of faith and allowing God to lead you through your process and knowing that you can overcome it, but you have to do the footwork. 
Amen. That is so good. Well, thank you so much, um, Nedra. I know um, your book's not out right now, but um, is it available for pre-order or anything like that? Yeah. So right now um, it's available at my website. Um, so you can find it at www.rightnowgirl.com. Um, and it will be available on some other platforms in a few weeks, but right now it's available for pre-order. Okay. And is there anybody you would like to shout out or anything like that? Um, so I'd like to shout, shout out um, my publisher, Naisha D. Davis, for just helping me along these projects and helping me to kind of get them out in the world. I also would like to shout out Dr. Lawrence Burwell for just kind of being a martyr in my life and just a person of influence that really just shows me like, you know, Black excellence is real. You can do anything you want to do. Um, and just everybody who's been supportive of me during my process of writing the story and just help me to kind of get through those things. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Nedra, for um, coming on the show today. It was incredible. I love the conversation. I feel like it's a very good conversation. Yes. So I would love to invite you back in the future. I know you got more books that you're writing, so you can come back anytime. Um, so guys, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of the Author Push Talk Show. Um, and until we meet again, see you later. Wow. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.